It's been a while since we've engaged in this academic exercise, and I just uh, reminded Professor Chambliss and Scalari that we need to um, do this a little more frequently. Uh, a question that has plagued concerned citizens throughout the nation's history is, what is the appropriate role of government? With the continual diversification of the nation, coupled with increasing new technologies and the influence of globalization, the question has additional implications. Subscribers of various schools of political thought have provided conflicting answers to these questions. In today's event, a con conversation between two liberals, two of our most passionate and inspirational professors, who are also both prolific writers, will address many of the salient issues of over times that are relevant to the initial question. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a resounding welcome to Professor Jack Chambliss of Economics, <laughs> Professor John Scalaro, Fine Arts and Humanities. In this conversation, each professor will have the opportunity to pose a question to the other, and we will have, they will have rebuttal and conversation. If the discussion get a bit too winded, that's the only time that I will intercede to move the, discussion, the conversation along. Uh, we will try to go until about 2.30 with the conversation, and after that time, we'll open up the, the floor for questions. If you have a question, please um, come this way to the mic and pose your question. Um, Professor Chambliss, you have the first question. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Before I begin, I want to thank all of you for taking the time to be here on a Wednesday afternoon. Uh, that speaks a lot about your willingness to be intellectually engaged in differences of opinion, and also want to thank Professor Scalaro. He and I have uh, been doing this off and on for 20 years, and it is, as I was telling him earlier, somewhat bittersweet that this will be our last uh, opportunity in all likelihood to sit down in a forum like this uh, to do this. So I want to, first of all, thank you for being here today to do this. Thank you. In uh, today's Orlando Sentinel, there's a, um, an article on front page uh, that says, more or poor here and across the United States. Uh, given the uh, recorded growth in poverty in the United States of America and a lot of uh, conversations have been taking place about income disparity, my first question for you, Professor, is do you think there should be limits on how much money a person should be allowed to earn in the United States, and if so, why? Well, uh, I'll pull a Rick Perry on you first. Um, was your question about the Department of Defense? Uh, no. Oh, it was about poverty in the United States and uh, whether or not an income uh, limit should be imposed. Uh, well, uh, since uh, I, like you are, uh, am a part of the 1%. Um, you might be rather than part of the 99, oh, I'm sorry, I'm part of the 99%, not the 1%, yes. So I would prefer uh, to um, impose uh, not a limit on what, uh, let's say, uh, middle-class Americans can earn, or even the poor, but a limit on uh, the exceptionally wealthy in our country and the kind of income they rake in. Uh, I could reference uh, Warren Buffett, who is, I believe, he's a multi-billionaire, mm -hmm. who uh, said not so long ago, tax me more. So I think Buffett uh, probably embraces uh, the view that uh, the exceptionally wealthy in this country of uh, which there are uh, a rather high percentage of exceptionally wealthy individuals in this country should be taxed more. And I would rather uh, not impose, uh, you know, similar limits on those who are poor in terms of uh, earning uh, substantial income to meet whatever their expenses are. That would be my honest response. So rather than imposing an artificial ceiling on what you can earn, you would prefer uh, that the tax code be used to create some sort of earnings ceiling 
I, I, I think those who are exceptionally uh, wealthy in this country uh, should be, of course, taxed more, should pay a higher percentage uh, of taxes uh, based on, you know, their income and so forth and so on. I, I, I think that is uh, a more equitable way to distribute wealth in this country. Otherwise, the wealth is essentially um, parked uh, up here and not uh, very equitably distributed among those who earn substantially less. One concern I have about that position, first of all, according to, the IR, according to IRS data, uh, the top 1% of income earners in the United States of America already pay uh, well over 38% of all the tax revenue collected by uh, the United States government. And the top 5% of income earners pay over 50% of all taxes collected. So if we're looking for some definition of equity or fairness, I, it seems like the tax code is already accomplishing that where people like Oprah Winfrey and the late Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, uh, even Warren Buffett, that crowd is already contributing um, a, a great deal of money towards running this country and providing the social welfare benefits that a lot of people have gotten accustomed to. With respect to Warren Buffett, uh, the, his income tax returns already give him the opportunity I believe it's line 75 or 76 on your income tax returns. My, my accountant told me and I forgot. But the, li the line is there that allows you to write in an amount that you would like to send to the IRS on top of what the IRS already says that you owe. So I think Warren Buffett's being a little bit disingenuous to say tax me more when obviously he can afford an accountant that could create whatever tax he thinks he should be paying. And the bigger problem I have with Warren Buffett is just because he believes that he should be taxed more, I don't think uh, that should be forced upon other productive individuals that have provided us with everything from Facebook to cell phones and high definition television sets. If they believe they're paying enough and the IRS says that they're paying a lot already, I, I think using the tax code to punish those just because Warren Buffett has the opinion that they should pay more and Warren Buffett isn't paying more on his own, I think that's um, uh, showing a gross misunderstanding of what rich people are already paying and uh, it also ignores the reality that the wealthy have gotten to be wealthy by providing us with a lot of great things and a lot of jobs working for their companies. Well, I, I, I think uh, the exceptionally wealthy in this country can afford uh, whatever their obligations are or uh, whatever the commitments uh, are which they have incurred and so forth. Uh, and that includes, uh, you know, uh, other zones such as uh, health care and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but I, I really think uh, that uh, those who are exceptionally wealthy should be uh, more, uh, to use a uh, hot word, brutally penalized. Uh, than the exceptionally poor in this country in order to more equitably distribute wealth. That is my point, because the wealthy like Oprah Winfrey and Warren Buffett and others can afford to do that. And uh, their pocket will not shrink as a result of contributing more and so forth. They will not even feel it, whereas from my point of view, the poor feel the pain of not having enough money to even meet basic expenditures, thus uh, foreclosures mm -hmm. and other uh, negative results uh, from uh, the inequity, which seems to be uh, characteristic of what's going on in this country at this time. But a great deal of the evidence points to the fact that poor people are not poor uh, because uh, Mr. Zuckerberg is rich. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg hasn't stolen from anybody. Uh, he hasn't hurt anybody to gain his wealth. Uh, poor people in this country are poor for a wide variety of reasons that go to the quality of public education, uh, their family history, uh, geographic location. There are, there are many issues that explain poverty in this country, but the idea of penalizing someone for doing something that has improved our lives, if, if you guys were to just come up with a list of what you're wearing today and how you got here today and what you're going to eat today, and you think about all the individuals who probably make more money than you, who help design and create and provide those sorts of things, this inherent jealousy 
of those wildly productive people and using the words like equi equity to redistribute their wealth, let's think about this for a moment. We have, we have tried this spread the wealth policy before. And if you, if you do your own research on what happens when uh, income taxes increase on the wealthiest individuals in the country, routinely revenue growth either, either slows or and in many cases in this country it's actually gone down. Franklin Roosevelt found this out during World War II. We found it out with tax, found this out with tax increases by Herbert Hoover. Uh, we, we saw this when George Bush Sr. passed the largest tax increase to that point in history. In America's history, tax revenue actually went down. And just the opposite has happened when you cut taxes. Bill Clinton, in his last six years in office, cut taxes repeatedly and revenue went up, as did John F. Kennedy and Ronald Reagan. So if you want to punish rich people uh, raising their taxes, they're, they're smart enough to find the accountants with the fancy pencils, and we usually don't get the money that we think we're going to get from them. Well, I, I think I would rather uh, play off of some of uh, the points you just made, especially the last point, that uh, doing that constitutes a form of punishment on the wealthy, and reference um, an article that was forwarded to me this morning by General Vinod Segal of New Delhi in India, uh, who spoke here at the college once upon a time uh, X number of years ago, and uh, we are in communication via email on an ongoing basis. And uh, you may or may not remember uh, that three days ago, this past Saturday, November the 26th, was the third anniversary of the terrorist attack uh, in Mumbai, in India. And I'm referencing uh, a billionaire who owns hotels and a lot of other stuff, Ratan uh, Tata, who demonstrated the kind of uh, corporate social responsibility that I think is rare among uh, the exceptionally wealthy in this country. Uh, for example, um, those individuals who were either maimed or killed as a result of the terrorist attack in Mumbai, uh, Tata came to their rescue, let's call it, or to their assistance. And uh, he has uh, granted uh, those victims um, a full salary based on what their income was in terms of their last uh, check uh, based on the work they uh, completed uh, for life applied to uh, families of victims and so forth. Uh, he also has assumed uh, total responsibility for the education of the children of those families who were victims of that terrorist attack in Mumbai. So I could go on in terms of isolating uh, key points uh, which play off of the generosity of Tata. But I just want to close out that short point by, um, by quoting uh, what he represents. Let the world know what corporate social responsibility is. Yes, I, I have a question I'd like to pose to Professor Chambliss. And I'd also like to thank him uh, for, um, you know, taking the initiative to suggest that we meet today for this ongoing dialogue, uh, playing off of diverse issues of import. Um, I've always enjoyed his company uh, within such contexts, and uh, I've always read his articles and all of that. Uh, he referenced uh, the last time uh, that this uh, event uh, will occur, and... Um, I'm guessing that means that I'm not dying tomorrow the next day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe I'm looking forward to retirement, I don't know, within the next year or two. But here's my question to Professor Chambliss. Um, as some of you may not know, Professor Chambliss was born in Germany. And uh, he uh, spoke with me recently about his desire to return there for a visit. So... Uh, my, my question is uh, related to the healthcare system that is in place in not only Germany but in other parts of Europe like uh, Italy and Belgium and so forth and so on. And uh, uh, what I, I want to ask him is does he think that a version of the uh, quote unquote European healthcare system should be adopted by the United States of America? 
Well, a, a version of that has already been adopted by the United States of America. We're at a point right now where uh, around half of all health care spending is, is done uh, by uh, state and federal government. So we are certainly moving in that direction. The legislation recently signed by President Obama uh, moves us even further in the direction of a European model of health care uh, where uh, the taxes of you, please understand, uh, my, my, my mother and father, uh, sorry mom and dad if you end up watching this, uh, my mom and dad who are in their late 60s and my father's in, in has some very serious health issues, um, they are largely dependent in many ways on your tax dollars. And some of you may think, well, that's, that's fine. Um, and that's, that's fine. Okay, it, you believe you should be paying, so m my parents who didn't raise you should have health. Wonderful. But please understand, um, the President of the United States of America, when he or she takes the oath of office, they swear to preserve and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. So we have a well, like it or not, we have a rule book in this country that is very clear on the role of government in the lives of Americans. It's not the German rule book applied to us. It's not the French rule book that we think is better and therefore should unilaterally apply it to us. It is our rule book. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution of the United States of America gives the government the authority to use your taxes to provide for the common defense, to pay debts they incur in defending your life, liberty, and property, and it also gives the government the authority to use your tax dollars to promote the general welfare. The founders went on to define the general welfare very clearly. I'd like to share with you a quote from James Madison. In 1794, uh, Congress was considering uh, spending just $15,000 to relieve the suffering of French refugees who fled from insurrection in San Domingo to Baltimore and Philadelphia. James Madison, whom you should know is the principal author of our Constitution, he stood on the floor of the House and said, quote, I cannot undertake to lay my finger on that article of the Constitution which granted a right to Congress of expending on, on objects of benevolence, the money of their constituents. In 2011 language, this is very clear. Congress, according to the General Welfare Clause of the, that the Founding Fathers discussed very carefully, Congress does not have the right to take one dollar away from you to give it to my parents, to give it to me, to give it to your neighbor in the name of providing health care or any other benefit. So first of all, if the members of Congress and the President are going to swear to defend the Constitution, I fully expect them to honor their oath and not plunder you in the name of forced charity. The Constitution is very clear that it has an expectation of you to plan your own life as a free individual to govern your own affairs with your own money. And that includes preparing for periods of unemployment, periods where you may suffer ill health, a divorce, a bankruptcy, whatever the case may be. I am no more in favor of government taking your money to provide others with health care than I am the government taking your money to bail out General Motors or banks that ran their businesses like Las Vegas casinos. You live here, you have freedom, but part of freedom means personal responsibility, up to and including you getting the flu, having babies, or getting cancer someday. You're young now. You know that someday you're going to be older and you might get sick. The Constitution and real liberty suggest prepare now to bear your own responsibilities. Well, uh, such a document, uh, which Professor Chambliss referenced, namely the United States Constitution, exists, of course, in other forms in Europe, because you have constitutional governments in Europe as well. And that applies not only to Germany, but it also applies to uh, Belgium and France and Italy and other countries of Europe. Uh, now, when I was a student at a university in Belgium several decades plus ago, and then I'm going to update this, um, Let's see, uh, students who were enrolled in the university as international students and who were there six months or more, their health care was provided free of charge by the government of Belgium, which I think um, is uh, really uh, a lot better 
uh, in terms of uh, an application of uh, the general welfare and taking care of the general welfare. And besides, the minimal amount of money which um, I had once to pay for uh, pharmaceutical products, otherwise known as drugs or medicine or something like that, 75% of what was paid was refunded in total from a cash drawer in a main center uh, in Belgium and so forth. And I think that's rather admirable. And to me, the force of that uh, plays off of uh, what uh, Professor Chambliss referenced as, uh, you know, this concern reflected in the United States Constitution for the general welfare. Uh, how much more um, of an example uh, could uh, that uh, reflect than what I just represented? And then, and then, I have uh, family members who live uh, north of Venice in Italia, and uh, the same uh, statements are made by them relative to uh, the health care system that is in place in Italy. So this applies to other European countries, especially now that there is such a thing as the European Union, and so forth and so on, even though in certain cases Europeans pay let's say 40% or 50% of their income, uh, you know, which uh, covers health care costs and so forth. The uh, quality of care in Europe is a lot, lot better than the quality of care provided in the United States. And besides, the annual income of doctors is limited within that context and so forth, which doesn't apply here, I don't think, you know, and so forth, so on. So I think uh, when push comes to shove, if you really uh, compare and contrast the systems, uh, the two systems are not synonymous. And I think we could learn a lot from the European system of health care even now. You and, and, and one other point I'd like to add is immigrants who happen to reside in Europe Health care is also extended to them cost-free, and so forth, which I find uh, rather uh, provocative and also a reflection of what uh, that statement of the Constitution means when it focuses on the general welfare of citizens. The, the, so the problem, yeah, John, please. is that yeah. we don't operate under the Constitution of Germany or Belgium or Italy. Uh, they can do whatever their Constitution allows them to do. When you look at the reality of the cost of this, please, please understand, there, when Professor Scalaro says cost-free, I, I don't know if it's uh, a slip of the tongue, but there is nothing that's free. <laughs> If you go online, you can find this easily for yourself. It's widely known that the average person in these countries pays far greater income taxes and other taxes than we do in the United States of America. On average, a, fam a middle class family of four in America pays 33% of all of their income uh, combined in taxes, about one third, okay? In Europe, it averages over half of their income. Now, if, if you want, this is very simple, and I, and I applaud, you're right, uh, I am from Germany, and, and I'm reminded from, uh, by uh, my mother and others that uh, the Germans do this for people, uh, but I remind my mother that while I admire the Germans for, be will, for being willing to hear politicians say, if you want free health care and free daycare, here are, the, here are the taxes that you'll have to pay. And the Germans, and there's no dictator there. They haven't been forced. The Germans freely elect people who say, yes, I, I, will, I will charge you 56% of your income, but you won't have to worry about health care ever again. But the socialists who didn't want this got on boats and sailed to America. You see, those that wanted the security of government stayed there and they crafted their governments along the lines of taking from one to give to another. But the people who came here, and, and in many ways continue to come here, come here because the places they come from take too much from them. 
do too many th things to them. And, and to be clear, if, if you, again, you can find this for yourselves. Go research the average by controlling what doctors earn. You should read about the number of doctors who leave those countries to come to places like the United States of America. Read about the wait times to be seen in Australia and Canada and Great Britain. In Great Britain, because of controlled health care costs, at this point, there is currently a waiting list to get on the waiting list in Great Britain. The average length of time to be seen for an MRI in Canada is 77 days. If, you had, if a doctor told you today in Canada, we think something might be seriously wrong with you and we need to schedule an MRI, you would be seen 11 weeks later and you hope you don't die. By the way, you can find it out for yourself. The average number of people who do, in fact, die while they're on the waiting list to be seen. So the price of free health care has been extremely high tax burdens in these countries and wait times and suffering of those who are unfortunate enough not to be seen in a timely manner. This is not to say, by the way, that there are some wonderful doctors in Germany and in Italy and in Belgium, and some people do get seen quickly. And, if, and, and those people are not charged directly for the, the cost of service. But if you look at the overall standard of care, ladies and gentlemen, medical innovation, new drugs, new equipment, and all of the brilliant discoveries that, that make our lives better and save our lives, they predominantly take place in the United States of America, where we still, so far, allow profit to be a driving motive behind saving people's lives. If you give me the choice of a company seeking profit to deal with my cholesterol issues or asking somebody to do it out of love and kindness in the European model, I want the company seeking profit because I want my cholesterol dealt with. I don't want to go to a government clinic and hope that day I have a good doctor waiting on me. The last thing you want going forward in this country is for us to move. And, and, and one more thing, in many of the European countries, John, where they do this, you only have five or six million people. Low crime rates, the people are physically fit. We have 310 million people in a country with high crime, obesity, and other uh, social problems going on. The cost of delivering the free health care you envision in America would far exceed anything we could imagine compared to what takes place in Europe. Well, I'd like to return to your reference to the 35% of income paid by Americans. Wasn't that what you said? It's around 33%. Okay. okay. Uh, did you remember to add to that uh, property tax? Yes. In all, in all taxes combined, the average mm -hmm. middle-income family pays about one-third of their income well, in taxes. Well, I, I, I think it's a bit higher when you add other taxes it, it's, and it's so higher forth, if you if you such count as property the, tax and other taxes no, such a nature in this country so I, I I think there's a debatable question about the percentage of what Americans pay and the percentage of what Europeans pay uh, the point is despite the fact that Europeans probably pay more uh, in terms of a percentage of their income uh, the services provided uh, I think um, you know, are qualitatively better than is provided in the United States. And when you talk about, you know, cholesterol and all this kind of stuff, haven't some uh, pharmaceutical products in this country been banned because of the adverse results they have had on people who were given prescriptions? Sure. And, and so you have to ask some questions about uh, the depth of knowledge doctors have in this country about the uh, prescription medications they are prescribing and so forth and so on because of the adverse effects of such medications in certain cases on uh, their patients. Well, there is an so answer forth. to the so. question on, on the medications that have been banned very quickly. It, oftentimes, the Food and Drug Administration, a government organization that's in charge of the final say in whether medicines are safe, I will give the Europeans credit for this. Uh, they do allow their citizens uh, to engage in medical trials uh, much more frequently, frequently than Americans are allowed. If a drug company comes into to France, for example, and says, hey, we think we've got a drug that will work, but we believe it will have these side effects, we, don't, we think the probability of something bad happening is fairly low, the French government, I will give them credit for this, they do give uh, the French people the liberty uh, to try those drugs. Here in America, the trial lawyers have made it very difficult, even when you have very, very low probabilities of something going wrong. We still have the FDA panicking under the pressure of 
trial lawyers in litigation and banning drugs where you may have 10,000 people who have been benefited, one person got sicker, and then in a knee-jerk reaction, our federal government denies us the liberty to remain one of the 10,000 who still wants to take the drug. Okay, please. I'm, Professor Scalaro, I'm very interested in what your thoughts are on the Occupy Wall Street movement and Occupy Other Cities movement that is taking place right now. Well, uh, obviously, uh, I think uh, most of, uh, if not all of you, have heard about Zuccotti Park in New York and so forth, where uh, the Occupy Wall Street uh, protests began. And... Uh, then I think all of you are keenly aware of events related to Tahir Square in Egypt and so forth. And I wish to make uh, a rather obvious comparison between uh, these two protest movements. Uh, and what I really would like to say, first of all, is that uh, protests of such a nature remind me of the 1960s in this country, when I was actively engaged on the street against the brutal results of segregation, which was the law of the land, and so forth. And I distinctly remember that, um, you know, the modus operandi of uh, those of us who protested at that time was to use nonviolence. Of course, that plays off of, uh, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was a proponent of uh, nonviolence, which I think is an admirable option, which is still embraced by these protesters. And if I'm dead wrong, I think the police in certain parts of this country have uh, executed uh, methods that are rather brutal and that have caused severe injuries to protesters and so forth and so on. And, and even stuff I've been reading recently still invokes nonviolence as the method these protesters who are objecting to, you know, Wall Street and other stuff going on in this country, uh, the high unemployment rate, you know, and so forth and so on, I think that's a viable method that they embrace. And it reminds me of the 1960s when, of course, uh, over time, as a result of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, it worked and so forth and so on. So nonviolence is the way. And I think Tahir Square in Cairo and, uh, you know, the Occupy Wall Street uh, protesters embrace uh, the same modus operandi, which I deeply um, celebrate. The big difference between Egypt and the United States, and if you've been following these with any clarity at all, the Egyptians are demanding that the government stop doing things to them and the Americans are demanding that the government does things for them. The Egyptians want liberty, and they don't want to live under the type of control the Egyptian government has imposed upon them, where, for example, a huge portion of Egyptian citizens work for the government at artificial wages that are pushed up so much that it makes it almost impossible for an Egyptian to open a private business and compete with what the government is offering to public employees. So the Egyptians have taken to the street demanding greater liberty from what Thomas Jefferson recognized so long ago. He said, the inevitable progression of things is for government to gain ground and for liberty to yield. And so the Egyptians are t trying to take back that ground in the name of liberty while the Occupy Wall Street folks, if you, look at, if you read the signs carefully, uh, they're, they're not demanding things that would give them greater freedom. They are demanding things that would take away your freedom. They, they want you to, I, I've, I've seen uh, signs that say end capitalism, holding up signs, mind you, that say end capitalism while they're wearing clothes that were made by capitalist businesses their sign and their marker and the stick was probably made by some greedy capitalist. So they're, they're using the very products that capitalism creates and now saying capitalism is our enemy. You see signs that say, give us a $20 minimum wage when they don't understand that our current minimum wage already creates unemployment. I do, I do say this about the Occupy Wall Street folks. Um, part of what I've seen that I like is their complaints about government bailing out 
banks, and car companies, and other businesses. I find it to be, in addition to the fact that it is constitutionally reprehensible, I find it morally reprehensible that our government would take money away from people and give it to car companies that don't make good cars or to banks that didn't run their affairs the way they were supposed to. So the, the Occupy Wall Street people who protest that money being taken and given to business, amen, I agree with you completely. But you'll notice the twist to it. They want, instead of the money being taken to give to businesses, they want the money taken to be given to them. And, okay. and this, this is uh. symptomatic of a generation, um, final point, Yes. This is symptomatic of a generation, with all due uh, respect to the, those of you who are very young, 18, 19, 20 years old, a generation that has grown up believing that you somehow are entitled to things rather than having to go out and earn things. That doesn't apply to everybody in this room, but you know people who have this sort of victim mentality that someone owes them something. And as long as this Occupy Wall Street is based on somehow some false victim mentality, they're going to continue to hold up signs, but no employer is going to say, okay, take a bath, shave, and I'll give you a job. And in response to uh, some of your points about these uh, Occupy Wall Street protesters, I would like to reference one uh, seminal objective they have. And you will understand this since uh, we're part of an academic institution. And that has to do with affordable education. Now tell me if the tuition uh, in this college will be increased soon. Most likely, yes. Uh, yes, of course. And tell me if students who are already in the throes of debt have defaulted on repayment of uh, the money that, uh, you know, they have uh, now become indebted to repay. Absolutely. Defaults yes. on that. Uh, it's not because they uh, are not, uh, you know, conscientious enough to satisfy the debts they have incurred, but proportionate to the increase in tuition and the fact that, uh, you know, minimum wage and, uh, you know, other uh, income levels are quite low, you know, and so forth, so on, requiring students in certain cases to hold two or more jobs and to maintain a connection to the academic institution and to eventually, not just within uh, two to four years or within five years, but much longer to complete their education until they decide to, you know, step into a career or continue at the graduate level or something like that. So, so I think this objective of the Occupy Wall Street protesters uh, related to affordable education is a rather viable objective and so forth, which I think uh, a lot of us embrace. Um, however, uh, your tuition is going to go up, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. And that's regrettable because I think there are other ways to manage uh, such increases. And that's another story. That's a very good point. The, the complaint that the students have about their debt and the affordability of education. But, but once again, they're complaining about the result. I'm deep in debt and I don't have a job but they're not asking a better question. Um, you'll notice you do not see a lot of scientists, pharmacists, nurses, and mathematicians at the Occupy Wall Street movement. Think about it. Uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me finish this point. May I? You, you, just, to, just to finish the point, please. Yeah. Higher education, in many ways, I believe, has done a disservice to people over time. This is not, in my opinion, the year 1770 where, and this is not going to go over well, a, a, a well-rounded education in the humanities and the arts uh, should be expected of, of you. We live in a modern economy that has supply and demand curves. And if you major in music or humanities or uh, pre-Columbian art, okay, the demand for you is very low. So this may feel good while you're in college studying these things, but when you get out and stand there on the corner and say, I would like to have a job, please come interview me, while, while the nurses are getting jobs and the mathematicians are getting jobs and the pharmacists are start, the starting salary of pharmacists is $109,000 right out of pharmacy school, they have responded to the marketplace. They have 
provided skills that are in demand in a changing economy. So the colleges need to, need to do a much better job of preparing people for a real world where it's really nice if you take a couple of humanities classes, but if you major in something that's not in demand, a protest is not going to make you in demand all of a sudden. So my advice to students would be, don't go into debt for something that's not going to pay you enough to pay back the debt. I mean, it's very simple. No one owes you low tuition. No one owes you a job. Make good decisions, and you've got a greater chance of having a job. And returning to your point uh, about the fact that uh, certain uh, demographics related to our society were not present uh, at these uh, protests, uh, I was present uh, at the beginning of the uh, Occupy Orlando protest. But you're a humanities professor. <laughs> yes, I, uh, yeah, 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 yes, I am. And uh, my uh, student, whose uh, course name is Timothy Leary, who is sitting right there, was present. And I had a former student present. And Scott Maxwell, a uh, noted columnist with the Orlando Sentinel, was present, you know, and not just to write the story, and so forth and so on. So uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, individuals uh, present at these protests uh, do not only reflect that demographic of needy Americans, but are professionals in their own right, highly educated, and, uh, you know, they're there to give voice to their concerns. Because as, uh, you know, the great Russian writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn once said, silence only gives consent. And thus, yes, please, who has the next question? I do. Uh, yes, I would like you to give us your response to questions regarding uh, immigration policies in this country as far as what has been happening in the state of Arizona and the state of Alabama, and so separated by some distance, in terms of whether or not uh, you uh, support uh, such immigration legislation, or do you see such legislation as an extension of the biases that have already been uh, superimposed on immigrants who have come into this country? And then tell me if you believe uh, that wall, unlike what President Clinton once said, uh, between the United States and Mexico should never be torn down. Well, I think maybe the biggest mistake ever in immigration policy was allowing me in the country. But uh, beyond that, <laughs> this is where, as a uh, diehard libertarian, um, I, my Republican friends uh, get very upset with me. So we've agreed to disagree on this subject. Um, I think it's reprehensible what we are doing to immigrants trying to get over here into this country. It is very clear. I mean, anybody understands that with, with any policy, uh, there are benefits and there are costs. Sure, uh, there are. My, my brother is in law enforcement, a high-ranking official in, uh, near Tulsa, Oklahoma, and he tells me about the immigrants that come over there and are creating certain problems uh, that they're having to deal with. Uh, so he's in the, let's build a wall and, and take these things more seriously. Um, but when you look at the data on the history of immigration in the United States of America, especially you know, even recent data, we get a lot more benefits from immigrants who come over here than we are incurring costs. Immigrants who are here go on welfare with less frequency than native-born Americans. They commit, on average, fewer crimes than native-born Americans. Uh, they, one generation after being here, many immigrant groups earn more money than the average American. Uh, so immigrants have provided a long and rich history of providing for a growing economic base. If you go, those of you that travel to cities all over America, you can see the long hours that obvious immigrants are putting into their small shops and stores and their very high savings rates that they have and the contributions they make to creating jobs for Americans that live there. So 
And the idea that somehow we're going to solve our problems with a wall or building a retractable dome over the United States of America or chasing people around the block in Arizona because they, they don't look wide enough, whatever the standard may be, uh, my experience in 20 years in the classroom as a professor has been uh, that immigrants understand uh, the concept of liberty and opportunity and personal responsibility more than my native-born Americans. Those people who come here overall, I have discovered in my class, and the data supports this, they're seeking an opportunity uh, to have a better life than the place they came from. I have half-jokingly uh, told my students that uh, given my experience with teaching Americans about liberty and responsibility and limited government compared to my experience with Eastern Europeans, Russians, Middle Easterners, Cubans, Venezuelans now. Uh, if, if I could adopt an immigration policy, it would be for every immigrant that successfully arrives in America from a place uh, where they had been experiencing tyranny, we would kick three Americans out Okay, uh, since Americans don't seem to have an appreciation for freedom anymore, I say bring in more immigrants from Cuba and Venezuela and Estonia and let the Americans go live in Cuba for a while and, and see what government actually does to people. So do you support uh, what Reagan said about the Berlin Wall? Tear down this wall. Oh, absolutely. No walls, no limitations. Of course, you, some people are going to slip through the cracks. You can't protect everybody from everything. Some immigrants can come over here and, and do things. Okay, arrest them then, just kick them out, whatever. That wall should have come down. No wall, in my opinion, should be built. And, and as a matter of fact, if you listen to the Bill Gates and the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world, since September the 11th, starting with the Bush administration, we have made it very, very difficult for highly skilled, highly educated immigrants to get into this country. And as a result, since Americans overall can't do math and science as well as foreigners can, we have a tremendous shortage of mathematicians and scientists here because we're not letting... We, we used to be the greatest thief in the world. We would steal all the smartest people from around the world, get them here, and have them work for our businesses, and our economy flourished. Now we're making it hard for those people to get here, and they're saying, well, I guess I'll stay in China and start a business here that's going to be a direct competitor with the United States of America. So, so one, uh, can, 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 I, can I ask one more question regarding that uh, based on... Uh, your support of what I assume to be states' rights uh, in the case of Arizona and Alabama and other states? Or would you justify the imposition of restrictions on states by the federal government relative to uh, the problem uh, with immigrants. Yeah, in this that, country. that you see, is, that's, the question. that's an outstanding question, and unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for that because I do, I simultaneously respect states' rights, but, but then again, some of the states wanted to argue states' rights to justify slavery, okay? Um, and I wouldn't have supported that. So uh, the, the federal constitution, um, I think, in some matters that pertain uh, to human rights, um, has to sometimes be uh, taken into account even if some states are having particular problems in dealing uh, with the people that they're uncomfortable, uh, who they're uncomfortable with coming in. Um, and that may seem like a cop-out uh, because I do believe in state rights. But I, I think in this particular case, we need to give greater consideration uh, to the federal constitution than we do to a state doing something that is very arguably a violation of, of the rights of people uh, who are living in that state or moving to that state. Should the immigration laws be changed? I don't know. Um, again, I don't, I don't know if I'm comfortable with the phrase illegal immigration because I'm more comfortable with them being here than I'm comfortable with them not. Okay, your turn. I'm curious. What is your favorite political philosopher of all time, and why? What, what, is, what, what helps get to the crux of the ideology well, well, that you represent well, well, here today? Well, that, that, that's a, uh, an easy question for me to uh, answer. Um, long ago, uh, I was introduced to the literary works of the great German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. And... Um, 
I kind of embrace um, lots of his ideas because Nietzsche uh, held the view that all systems should be placed under the microscope of criticism and that no system was exempt. That includes political systems of diverse kinds, social systems of diverse kinds, religious systems of diverse kinds. All systems should be placed under the microscope of criticism. And then Nietzsche also said that um, in uh, those political systems which embrace uh, democracy or a version thereof, uh, what he thought really happened was that um, uh, the principle of the tyranny of the majority monopolized the landscape and thus giving uh, little voice uh, to uh, the minority, uh, however you define that demographic and so forth and so on. So Nietzsche supported uh, a more powerful voice of um, the minority within any society because he was uh, obviously um, um, struck by the fact that the tyranny of the majority seemed to dominate the landscape, which also applies to democratic systems such as ours in certain cases when the majority rules. And perhaps in certain cases, uh, the uh, voice of the minority is more accurate than the voice of the majority. But I mean, you know, so Nietzsche is my favorite uh, philosopher of German descent. <laughs> Well, I'm often inclined to dovetail towards John Locke because I thought the courage that he had in 1690 to begin writing his treatises on government where he argued that we all have a God-given right to life, liberty, and property. I think to be the first person to really try to drive that point home, even though he was living under the power of a king, was an amazing, was an amazing thing. Um, but... I think overall, Frederick Bastiat, uh, there's a book in the bookstore right now, I think it costs three or four dollars, so first don't have a heart attack that there's a three dollar or four dollar book in the bookstore. Uh, but the name of the book, it can be easily found, is The Law. Uh, and Bastiat uh, writes uh, in The Law, if I can find the place uh, I missed, he says, life faculties, production, in other words, individuality, liberty, property, this is man. And in spite of the cunning of artful political leaders, these three gifts from God precede all human legislation and are superior to it. Thus, since an individual cannot lawfully use force against the person, liberty, or property of another individual, then the common force, for the same reason, cannot lawfully be used to destroy the person, liberty, or property of individuals or groups. I think Bastiat, along with Locke and others, clearly recognized an amazing thing that, that we are all born. Whether you believe, we, you may be agnostic and, and not believe in God, that's fine. Many of, some of the agnostic founders believe that you have a natural right to your life, your liberty, your liberty meaning your right to do anything peaceful, and to your property. And Locke, a French economist in 1849, wrote a beautiful book. I think it will change your life, many of you, if you pick this thing up uh, and read it. And I'd be happy to talk to you about it in my office if you would like. And Bastiat would be in complete agreement with what Professor Scolaro is saying. And I love what you said about the tyranny of the majority. We don't, we don't often think about this thing called democracy and how destructive it can be. The idea of majority rules presupposes that the majority is always right. And that's not the case. In the, under majority rule, we used to have slavery. Under majority rule, women couldn't vote. Under majority rule, we tell consenting adults of the same gender, no, I am heterosexual, you're homosexual, I disapprove of what you're doing with another consenting adult, so here's a law for you minorities, and you can't do this. The same law that says you may not gamble, you may not buy beer on Sunday. These are all laws where you get 51 people bossing around the other 49. This is why the founders warned about 
warned that we should avoid becoming a democracy where majority rules because when you see majority rule that sometimes leads to mob rule so I would agree that the underpinnings of what Nietzsche is saying, especially the part about challenging all systems, Thomas Jefferson, Desmond might correct me if I'm, I'm flawed here, I believe Thomas Jefferson made an argument that every 20 years or so we should just throw out the entire government and start all over again. He was a, uh, he was a wild libertarian uh, who, uh, who I, I appreciated very much. So I've always leaned towards the philosophers that believe you are an individual, uh, the government should respect your rights as an individual, and, and not busy itself in passing laws that make you stop doing things just because somebody else disapproves, unless you're violating the rights of your fellow man. Mm -hmm. I am uh, not a John Locke fan. I'm a Thomas Hobbes fan, okay. uh, based on you know, one of his literary works, the title of which is Leviathan and so forth. But I do have a, a final question I'd like to pose uh, to Professor Chambliss. And this is a hot one from my point of view. Um, I, I have data I could uh, trot out, but I'll just uh, summarize the data uh, about which I already know. Uh, please explain to me why the United States of America has never elected a woman president when in fact Golda Meir was the Prime Minister of Israel, Margaret Thatcher uh, was uh, the Prime Minister of England, uh, Angela Merkel is the Chancellor of Germany now, and Indira Gandhi of India. Uh, so why has that uh, not happened in this country? And furthermore, why do a minor percentage of women occupy seats in Congress from all states, and why do a very uh, why does a very minor percentage of women uh, occupy upper level positions in corporate America? Now, What's going on in this country? The way you phrase the question makes it seem like it's my fault somehow. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it doesn't help when you have um, a relatively unbright Sarah Palin. <laughs> and a, a flaming socialist <laughs> like Hillary Clinton. I mean, we haven't had recent... Uh, what about uh, Michelle Bachman? Uh, no, kind of in the Palin uh, category. <laughs> um, my, uh, next, to, next to Ronald Reagan, my favorite world leader of all time is Margaret Thatcher. I loved Margaret Thatcher. I, I, would, I, would, uh, I would march on Washington, D.C., with beard and no deodorant, everything you have to have to be a protester today, uh, <laughs> to, to, to demand a change to our Constitution to allow foreign-born Margaret Thatcher, uh, I would vote for her after she was dead uh, to be President of the United States of America. So um, I, I don't think our recent choices um, have been very appealing when it comes to the female candidates that have been running, and that's obvious by the fact that they're not winning. Uh, we, we overcame uh, what many people thought would never be overcome in our country's history, and we, we elected President Obama. Uh, we have a country that's still 70% white, and we, I think, took tremendous steps towards showing that America really isn't what perhaps we've been perceived to be a racist, white-run country. I, I'm very, I was very thrilled uh, with the idea of Mr. Obama being president and very hopeful that he would be a productive, free-market uh, uh, president, even though his campaign indicated that was not going to be the case. So if we can overcome that enormous uh, barrier... Uh, I think it's a matter of time before the American people hear a logical, um, uh, intellectually attractive uh, female candidate, and I think it is going to take someone, I, my bet would be we'll have a Republican woman president before we have a Democratic woman president, because I think, um, and I may be wrong, and some of you who teach uh, these gender studies classes whatever, can correct me, just off the top of my head, I think the average voter wants to believe that the woman will be strong. Okay, that, that is superficial and it sounds silly to say, but I, I think superficial as we are, 
um, I, I think the average voter would want to want to believe that this woman would be like Margaret Thatcher, tough on defense, um, understanding the case for um, free markets and all these sorts of things. I'm, I don't think a liberal female uh, would be as palatable to the American people right now. I may be wrong, but I think it's okay. going to be a Republican first. Thank you. In order to even out the question, Professor Chambliss, you have a short question. While anyone in the audience who have a question, uh, you can come to the mic. Um, during this period of time. Um, do you believe that Valencia is doing the best job that it can in serving the needs of the community and the country and the students that we have here? Uh, <laughs> and my answer is no. Okay, and... Uh, Part of that is that I think uh, faculty uh, need to exert uh, more power at the college, uh, not only vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the uh, existing, uh, you know, unions or committees that uh, exist here, but in other ways as well. I also sometimes wonder if the college should not become more elitist in terms of restricting entry to prospective students without sounding uh, like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm down on uh, making uh, college available to everyone. But there's a side of me that does not think that um, everyone is a viable candidate to pursue a college education. Uh, because, come on, uh, we need good plumbers, don't we? You know, and all of this kind of stuff and so forth. So I think there's a broad spectrum uh, of options that um, uh, certain individuals and related to their gender should uh, pursue rather than simply thinking that, uh, wow, I need to graduate from a college or university and that's where I should be in my life. There are other options that are viable options to others uh, that I think uh, should be more seriously considered prompting me to wonder about whether or not uh, Valencia College and other public colleges and universities should become, in some cases, a little bit more elitist, as negative as that might sound. Response? I'm, I'm in complete agreement. I have in the, Professor Scalaro has been here 23 years. I've been here 20. And we have watched um, an ongoing erosion overall in the quality of students that we're getting at this institution. I think we're doing a disservice when President Obama makes comments that we want everybody to go to college, we expect everybody to go to college. That's a mistake. And, and whether it's plumbers or electricians or, or people that are going to be entrepreneurs, I think, it's, I think we lie to people by telling everyone in high school that everyone needs to go to college. And that's part of why so many people are so deep in debt without a job. They, they, if they would have started a training program somewhere or done something different uh, with their skills, uh, they wouldn't be in debt, they would have marketable skills, and, and they wouldn't be sitting in a classroom struggling in subjects that, um, that they're not prepared to take to begin with. So uh, I think we, um, we are in agreement that Valencia going forward needs to um, do a little bit more to, um, to be honest with people about uh, what you need to do to be ready to be in college and give people more to think about before they go see so deep in debt and make a bad decision. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, for your questions, if you just state your name and then pose a question. Hi, my name is Karen Sanchez. Thank you for coming today. Anyhow, uh, Professor Scalaro, I have a question for you. I am a full-time student here at Valencia. And I have a daughter here as well uh, that is a full-time student. Right now, we are both self-paying students. And um, my question is to you, I know that you said that you had some great ways maybe that you think to handle the affordability of education here at Valencia and other universities and schooling. Could you explain more in detail what some of your thoughts are and what advice you can give to me? Um, as helping my other children get through school? That's a very difficult question. <laughs> We're broke. That, 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 that's, a very, that's a very good question. 
but uh, I, I somehow I don't have uh, you know the solution in my hands, uh, and I can't wave a magic wand over you and your children or anything else in order to uh, now, resolve you uh, did such say a dilemma. You, okay, yeah. Uh, you're talking about affordability? Yes, you had said that you had some other ways that you, well, in well, your opinion... Well, I think, I think one option the college has neglected over the years, uh, since the college uh, has a demographic of single mothers, for example, uh, you know, who are younger, and all of that, not younger than you are, but younger, right. and so forth and so on. Uh, I think one of uh, the viable options the college could provide, which is... Um, expensive on the outside is uh, child care for uh, those students who have uh, very young children and who could benefit from uh, such an option the college would provide cost-free uh, thus saving them money that uh, they could perhaps apply to their education that would be a response of mine what percentage of young mothers that have children actually go on to graduate from an institution? Uh, I have no idea about the percentage. Okay. I'm sorry. It's I really small. don't. I but know I, that, but, but I know, but I know based on, you know, just engaging students in my own classes right. that, you know, there, there are mothers with young children who are students and so forth and so on. Okay. So I think that's something the college could do, which it has never done because of uh, certain liability issues or something like that, which I think can be resolved. Thank you. Um, just want to say thank you for the debate. It was great to watch. Um, my name is Yosef Singer, and Mr. Sklars, I have a question for you. Um, you proposed the idea of um, hitting the rich with the uh, rich tax, basically the poor envying them, so you know, we want to make it fair. Um, right now in this economy, we are trying to stimulate it for jobs, and mainly the rich like Oprah, Steve Jobs who passed away, and many of the other rich are the ones who are funding this. How is the idea that government knows best where to put the money to stimulate the economy better than letting the rich keep the money and reinvest it in their job uh, companies? Well, well, my only response to that is that I think one of the valid functions of government, uh, you know, is, uh, as Professor Chambliss has already referenced, to provide for the common welfare. And uh, I, I think the government has uh, options uh, relative to increasing the tax rate, uh, which, should it, which should actually uh, be imposed on the exceptionally wealthy. Uh, go ahead. Wouldn't this discourage um, wealthy people from either coming here and creating businesses or uh, staying here? Wouldn't I, they I, just move like... I, um, don't, I don't think, uh, I don't think uh, that would be the case. Well, uh, Bill Gates yes. just moved his uh, corporate headquarters to a place in the European area for lower tax rates. So it already is happening. And I mean, he is a, ma well, a major well, player. There are exceptionally wealthy individuals right. who will opt to do what you just referenced and so forth. But uh, there are other individuals, uh, one of whom I've already mentioned related to the, um, uh, the uh, terrorist attack in India who chooses another way to use his wealth to assist others in, in definitive ways. So, Thank you. you know, Professor the Chambliss, would you like their to plate. chime in? And yeah, I'm sorry. On the question about daycare at Valencia, we actually did take that up under consideration in faculty senate 17 or 18 years ago. And uh, I think it has some merit if, if, you, if, if it was run by a private company um, you, there are certainly charitable functions that could help out with that to help alleviate some of the costs of taking care of kids, but I think that would be something worth considering. But, but again, it's impossible to make it cost-free. If Valencia builds a daycare center and pays all the insurance and what have you, uh, the money just doesn't appear out of the air. It's got to come from somewhere, and so the other people without children would, would be expected naturally to pay more in tuition and fees. And if you don't have kids, you have to pay for somebody who does. And there, again, we're back to the question of justice. Um, and to the question about the wealthy, again, over and over again, we've experimented with this idea of, of raising taxes on the wealthy only to find that they didn't get to be rich by being stupid. 
Um, so they find ways to shelter their income, hide their income, not uh, invest in the new businesses and technologies that we want from them. Some stay, and some do well. I mean, I, Warren Buffett would stay, and he'd be fine, and, and others might. Uh, but a good number of them, history as being a very good guide here, would alter their behavior enough where we wouldn't achieve the type of outcome that uh, you would hope. Mine's kind of a two-pronged question. Um, the first of which is, um, Professor Scalari, you were speaking about the individual from India, um, the business owner, and how he opted to use his money. First, I'm just curious, this wasn't government mandated, correct? This no. was his own personal right. decision. His own initiative. Which, positive, and that, that goes to the discussion that we're having on liberty, he has every opportunity to do with what he wants with his funds. Secondly was, you, you brought up the fact that um, university tuition has gone up. It's gone up exponentially within the past 30 years. That being said, this isn't a private outsourced entity doing this. This is actually state governments who actually bring this up. Yeah. And with that being said, it's again, my personal opinion, that it's not being directed at the right areas. It needs to be directed at policy. I, I, I agree uh, fully with that. Uh, I have a major problem with the guy up in Tallahassee I call Scooter. <laughs> okay, and some of the stuff coming down from Tallahassee that uh, has affected you as a student in terms of uh, tuition increases and so forth and so on, and other stuff related to faculty in terms of contributing uh, now 3% of our own income to our own retirement and stuff like that. So, so I have some concerns about, um, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. And right. I think you're right that uh, the finger should be pointed at uh, legislators. And uh, uh, the person uh, I call Scooter, who is the governor of the state of Florida, if I can follow up just very quickly to two points. First, when it comes to the guy in India giving his own money to charity, you guys should know that on average, um, the last several years, America has, American citizens have given somewhere in the neighborhood of 290 to $300 billion to charity. That is more than the gross domestic product of many nations that we hold up as being wonderful places. Many, it's more than many Western European nations. Again, check it for yourself. You, go, you can go on the CIA fact book online and find the gross domestic product of every country in the world, and you can find data on what we give to charity. And because we've allowed free markets, for the most part, to exist in this country, we've become so wealthy that we have been willing to, to give so much of our money away. And of course, all of us in this room know that every time there's a tsunami or any disaster anywhere in the world, American charities show up faster than everybody else, including the home countries where these disasters take place. On the issue of tuition, it's not surprising that government would raise tuition. Uh, look at what government does with everything. Um, our property taxes go up. They raise license plate fees. Uh, they raise, you know, everything we do, government stays fairly ineffective in the way they deliver it, but they charge us more. And if you look at a beautiful example of capitalism, look at the University of Phoenix. We're already seeing free market higher education institutions that are gaining traction, gaining credibility around the country as a less expensive alternative to government simply saying, pay us more. So I think where we have that freedom for entrepreneurs to do things, we end up seeing some pretty amazing results. Hello, my name is Yasmin Lopez. And uh, my question is for Mr. Scal Scaloris. Is, uh, you say that Mr. Nietzsche is your favorite author, and he believes in minority rules, but then you want to make the rich pay more taxes. Isn't that exactly majority rules? So wouldn't you be contradicting yourself? Well, I, I don't uh, follow your logic there because I don't think... Uh, I, I'm not following your logic, uh, playing off of your question, if because I'm quite, logic, frankly, quite frankly... I'm Quite frankly... Uh, I, I, I don't think, uh, uh, you know, exceptionally wealthy individuals uh, constitute the majority of Americans. Well, you did say the 1% so is the wealthy that you want to make pay more, and yes. then you say, but the, the majority rules. So shouldn't the rich 
ask or vote themselves if they feel like paying more, and then if they vote no, then the ones that want to just do the donation, like Mr. Chambliss said in their taxes, that they have the option for anyway? Uh, I don't think the wealthy should be given any options because they have enough money even after they pay an exceptional uh, higher rate of taxes from my point of view. Uh, they will not suffer at all. But to and her so point, forth. it's... So, so I, I don't see, well, I don't see it as a, a counter to Nietzsche. He was really talking about uh, uh, minorities. Uh, isn't, isn't this country at this time um, controlled by the wealthy? That's the question. Uh, who have the money to pay, even those who occupy seats in Congress, uh, who supposedly function as lobbyists, as in the case of one of our Republican presidential candidates, uh, you know, was paid. So, I mean, come on. You know, that's my response. For good or ill. Yes, okay. But she does raise an interesting point that if Nietzsche is opposed to the concept of the tyranny of the majority, and the majority of the Americans are not rich, then it would seem that they're trying to use the one man, one vote system that we have to impose tyranny on the 1% who are rich to create policies that would take that money away from the minority. The rich are a functioning minority in our country. And so, and if, he, and if Nietzsche is in support of challenging all systems, and if the current system is moving towards socialism, it would seem that Nietzsche would not only be in favor of challenging that system, but he would be in favor of challenging what is underlying that system, and that is the idea that those who make less should use force, in this case, the force of government, to take away from those who make more. So it, it really does seem to, to line up with what he's saying, and it would sound like Nietzsche would say, leave the wealthy alone. They've served their fellow man, and just because they're smaller in number, you have no right to go after them and take away their stuff. Oh, good afternoon. I'm a visitor to your college in your state today, and I was very honored to have the opportunity to hear you both speak. It was very interesting. I have some questions on uh, the majority of your debates on different topics. The first question that you presented is, um, do you believe that there should be a capital, uh, a cap on wage and income? And it uh, deviated off to um, taxation of the rich. My question is, do you think that there should be a wage cap on some industries? Do you want to go first? Or go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, not at all, anywhere, ever. Uh, first of all, for those of you have, who have taken economics from anyone, you, you see what happens when, and I don't have a marker, so I can't draw a supply and demand curve right now. It's my, <laughs> my fallback position is always supply and demand. Um, Any time prices settle at some equilibrium level, no matter what it is, and government throughout history has come in and forced prices below that level, it creates immediate distortions. Uh, on the grandest scale, we saw the Soviet Union, where they controlled wages and prices on everything, and we saw horrific shortages of everything. People waited in long lines because when you force prices down, it discourages the suppliers from supplying the good or service. It encourages buyers to try to find more of that good or service. So you have more buyers than sellers, so you have shortages in black markets. And, and in the, so if we control wages, what we're, what we're doing is creating distortions in the market. I mentioned pharmacists making 109000 a year. Imagine a law where the government says, we think drug prices are too high, and we think part of the problem may be what pharmacists earn, so let's pass a law where you can only make $60,000 as a pharmacist. Well, that would discourage people from going into pharmacy school. It would create a shortage of pharmacists, and I don't know about you, but I don't want to hear, well, your medicine will be ready in about 10 days. Well, I'm sick now. Well, yeah, but the one pharmacist we have is on vacation, 
and this law is passed, we've got controls that don't let us pay pharmacists what the market is, is bearing, so it'll be 10 days. We hope, we hope you stop coughing soon. So <laughs> I, I, I don't support any controls on anybody. If, if, a, if an NBA basketball player makes more money in a week than I make in a year, God bless him for being in a market where the people are willing to pay him that. I don't care. He's not taking it Thank from you. me. Thank you very much. We have a lot. Thank you. Have the next question, please. I'm a libertarian as well, uh, but I'm also a humanist. Uh, and my question uh, pertains to the profit motive, and specifically the profit motive in healthcare. So uh, my question is, do you, feel, do you feel that it's a bit insidious to make a profit out of people suffering, and specifically health care? I, I, I would say definitely it's insidious, <laughs> you know, basically. And that's one of the reasons uh, why I think uh, the health care system in uh, parts of Europe uh, restrict the income of doctors and so forth. So that would be my response to that. Yeah, it, it's absurd from my point of view. Um, you know, because uh, others in education who are teaching in public school and so forth and so on, uh, their income is, uh, <laughs> you know, very low and so forth and so on. There's a, there's a wonderful little coffee shop in Winter Garden called Oxum. And that, and they, I mean, they have great coffee. I mean, we, I drink this so much, I'm shaking at one in the morning, okay? And they give all of their profit freely to missionaries and charities in Ethiopia, all of it. That's a wonderful thing, but they have the freedom to make that choice. So if you believe your purpose is to help your fellow man and give away profit, great, go do it. But what we see in healthcare and in any other industry, that is, if there's a profit motive, it's not, John, it's not, a, it's not earning profit off of our suffering, it's trying to earn profit so we won't suffer anymore. Their goal is profit. But are the end result of that search for profit is that they cure things that, that hurt us. And, and so, again, without that motive, you, you wouldn't have enough people pursuing those objectives. Hi, my name is Brandon Sanjimino. You're probably both aware I have both of your classes. Th this is, uh, We're sorry for, for that, by the way. <laughs> 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 this is for Professor Scolaro. Um, I remember in your Renaissance class when we were discussing Cosmo de' Medici, you said he lowered taxes on the poor, and you're, you're proposing that we raise taxes on the rich. But back in, those, back in the 15th century, during the Renaissance, Cosmo de' Medici did not raise taxes, and the, the economy flourished. Why do you think we should raise taxes now, when back then the economy flourished, because Cosmo de' Medici, even though he didn't raise taxes on the rich, but he lowered it for the poor, made the economy flourish? Uh, well, uh, you know, you're talking about the period around 1427 when a uh, new proposal was initiated uh, relative to the fact that the poor were paying uh, the same uh, uh, tax rate on income earned as the wealthy were. And so thus the initiative was to lower uh, the rate paid uh, by the poor. Uh, the other uh, point about uh, the fact that the Medici family did not increase uh, the tax rate on the wealthy, um, in the case of Cosimo de' Medici, uh, you may remember this, over the course of his life, he donated, so he was a philanthropist, uh, he was beneficent, he donated uh, the equivalent of $10 million to uh, Florence, which uh, eventually resulted in uh, the fact that Florence became the intellectual, the economic, the artistic, and the manufacturing center of Western Europe. So he used his money, he used his wealth, uh, you know, in a very effective way. Um, a philosopher centuries ago, Ibn Khaldun said, at the beginning of the dynasty, government receives a large revenue from small taxation. At the end of the dynasty, government receives small revenue from large taxation. So there's an important lesson here, and it's, it doesn't matter if it's 1427 or 2027. History is a very good guide that every time we raise taxes on people that are productive, ultimately the, the economy suffers and we get less revenue. So I would be in favor of abolishing income taxes altogether and replacing what we, we from 1776 to 1913, we had a, a sales tax. 
that ran the whole country. Next question, please. Good afternoon. Hold on, a little short. My name is Jocelyn, um, and this is for Professor Scalaro. I was wondering. So basically, you agree with stealing from other constituents who have worked hard for their dollar to give to those forcibly by taxes. I was wondering, what's the difference between someone else maybe stealing a car, stealing someone else's jewelry, to give it to someone else? Uh, that would be a crime. <laughs> so uh, isn't it a crime by. if you're taking someone else's money to give uh, well, to someone else? Well, I, I don't think I would sanction theft as a, uh, as, as a way of... Uh, contributing to the welfare of the many, you know, uh, at that point, may maybe maybe your point is uh, uh, doesn't doesn't uh, your former reference encourage that, and uh, if it does, that would not be my objective at all. Because a car know. or jewelry, that's personal property, so yes. is money. Yes, it is. Yes. So, what exactly yeah. is the difference in um, your eyes? I'm not sure. Uh, you, 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 can, you can take your jewelry and pawn it and then apply the money <laughs> in a good way. You know, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, and Bastiat answers that very clearly. He says, the law, and I hear this all the time from students, but it's, it's legal to do this. Wow, does that make it right? Think about it before you say it's legal to do this. Slavery used to be legal again. Bastiat says, the law has placed the collective force at the disposal of the unscrupulous who wish without risk to exploit the person, liberty, and property of others. It has converted plunder into a right. So just because it's legal for the government to take from one to give to another, Bastiat argues that doesn't make it right. So I have, we have no more right to steal your jewelry than we do to steal your money. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Kevin Anderson, and I have a question for uh, Professor Scalaro. You say that you prefer for free health care in many countries, but uh, my mother came from Cuba, and Cuba is a horrible place for free health care. She talked about how there was no medicine, even though there was free health care. So if you have free health care, but no medicine to help with, what you ha with your problems, then what's the point of having free health care? Well, I, I think your point about Cuba uh, under uh, the conditions faced by, uh, you know, residents of Cuba at this time and even uh, during the period of Fidel Castro, maybe that's accurate what you're saying. I don't really know. Uh, maybe uh, what you just referenced about uh, your mother and Cuba and health care is an exception to the European uh, system which seems to be in place and seems to be a very effective system was my point. So uh, I, I, I think not every country is, you know, um, exactly synonymous. And so maybe Cuba is an exception, which is unfortunate, but maybe that has to do more with the uh, politics of Cuba related to Fidel and now his successor in the form of his brother. Good afternoon, professors. My name is Sunny Das. I am in uh, Professor, I should say I have the distinct pleasure of being in Professor Chambliss's economics class. <laughs> Which won't help your grade one bit. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that in yeah, there for nice you. Nice try. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, I drink like a fish. <laughs> uh, and I do hope I have the uh, pleasure of being in your class, Professor Scalara. Sc Scalara. Uh, two part question. First, Professor Scalara. Going back to the uh, beginning of this debate, you had, uh, we discussed that uh, the rich should pay more taxes. What do you believe is a fair cutoff point to where you can say these folks are rich and they should pay more and these folks are poor and they shouldn't? And who should decide that if you don't have an answer? Uh, well, I think that would be a viable function of the United States government at the federal level uh, rather than deferring to, uh, you know, states' rights and so forth. Uh, I, I would, I would uh, support um, an increase in uh, the tax rate for those who earn uh, $200,000 or more. Okay, fair answer. And Professor Chambliss, so coming back to the discussion that the rich should pay more taxes, uh, I believe you're a strong proponent, uh, proponent of uh, everybody paying lower taxes than where we're at right now. Do you believe uh, somebody sitting in a corner office on the 22nd floor of some skyscraper on Wall Street that bundled CDOs and sold them to the Chinese and made $100 million <laughs> in commission should pay 
less taxes. Given that he's typically not going to go out and do what small business does or the small business person does, which is hire people. So what exactly did he do that was wrong or unproductive when he uh, invested his time and energy in investment instruments that the Chinese then used to try to grow their economy? I, I think underlying, the underlying assumption of your question is that somehow someone who invents a new phone or cures a disease, that their $100 million is more laudable than somebody that's involved in the financial sector moving papers around. Uh, but who gets to make the decision on whether somebody moving papers around that helps China build more roads or build more hospitals, who gets to make the call as to whether or not that's better than somebody who's built a phone. I, I'm not owning a cell phone. I've, what, I don't care about new cell phones being produced. But I am interested in how he, if he can make $100 million moving around these investment instruments around the world, uh, that must have value. It doesn't come from nowhere. And it has value because it ends up affecting the economy of the nations that he's doing this for buy at least $100 million or he wouldn't earn it to begin with. So I don't want to ask, as long as they're not violating the life, liberty, and property of their fellow man, I don't want the government asking any questions about whether it's okay and coming up with some definition of when it's okay for someone to make $100 million. Go make it. Go pick a major where you can make that. Fine. So Professor Chambliss, um, that activity should be taxed at the same rate as workers. Uh, I... <laughs> You mean should there be a flat income tax no, again? Should it be a tax at the same rate as you? Yes, and but but not in form of an income tax. When that when that cat making a hundred million dollars goes out to buy uh, cars and buildings and jets, give him a ten percent national sales tax. He's going to end up paying a lot more on what he spends than the government's going to get. When I spend 10% at Goodwill or at a lawnmower shop, so uh, fine, tax is the same rate. Yes. Thank you. I, I just want you to know I'm in complete agreement, so please and consider still my help your grade whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is uh, Nick Potts, and I wanted to talk to you uh, something a little bit off topic from what you discussed, but that's been in the news recently. Um, a lot of people have been critical of the role the Federal Reserve has played with the economy, saying it's been more detrimental than beneficial, and uh, some of the politicians have called for getting rid of it. Do you believe that we should get rid of the Federal Reserve, and what do you think would happen if we did? Yes. <laughs> uh, I, the, I, am, I am in the Ron Paul camp that an artificial entity artificially manipulating the supply of money and interest rates, if you look at post-World War I Germany, if you look at modern-day Zimbabwe, if you look what's happened around the world when a central bank is given the authority to do the things our Federal Reserve Bank does, it ends up leading to a falling value of the currency much higher prices that the people have to pay for everything. I'm in favor of returning to the gold standard and having the marketplace determine interest rates without some entity lording over me determining whether I can afford my house or not. Uh, let's do away with them. Fine. They were created in 1913 by Congress. That gives Congress the authority to get rid of them, and I'd be happy to see them go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nate. Um, gentlemen, you have uh, two minutes for closing statements. Uh, well, uh, I uh, deeply appreciate uh, all of you who took the time uh, to uh, be part of this uh, unique event uh, today, on a Thursday afternoon. At this time, uh, I think most of us aren't here, and uh, here you are. So I deeply appreciate uh, your presence, uh, your attentive listening skills, and uh, the questions you have posed um, from the mic to my left. Um, and I just think this is an important um, dialogue uh, to continue at different times. Uh, you know, as, as um, you know, the months ahead pass, I'd like to see us do more of this as we used to do, and so forth and so on. Thank you very much. I agree completely. It's nice to see all of you here. and. No matter what 
uh, the, a college mission is. It should encourage professors to get out of the classroom and, and mix it up every now and then so that people can learn and, and have their views challenged and think about things in a different way. Uh, so it was great to see all of you here. I would offer one more parting comment uh, that I t say to my students on the last of every class. Um, I would encourage all of you going forward when you think about the role of government in your life, trust yourself first. Because if you don't trust yourself to make good decisions, the folks in Tallahassee and Washington, D.C. are all too willing to make decisions for you. And world history is very clear on this point. The more individuals give up the right to make their own choices, the more government tramples their rights in the long run. And our country is getting perilously close to that point where government's going to be doing a lot more to us and charging us for it. So your generation is going to have to think about this very carefully going forward. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much.